Hey, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to, uh, again, my backyard. Um, Fridays are typically my day off, so we are gonna continue on doing this 10 a.m. devotional. Um, we're in The Storm-Tossed Family, uh, a book written by Russell Moore. Um, we're in chapter six, and it's focusing a lot about the, the roles of men and women in relationship to the family and how the cross shapes that family. Let's continue on from where we left off. This is important because if we do not start with the truth of a common humanity in the creation and in the crucifixion, we will end up defying gender distinctions in ways that harm one another and lead us to worship a different God. In teaching the Galatian churches about our union with Jesus and the curse he bore and the life he gives from the cross, Paul concluded that, again, there is no Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So in Galatians 3.28, this does not mean that the cross obliterates the created order, an order that both Jesus and Paul elsewhere affirmed. Rather, this text defined the meaning of inheritance. The text continued, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. That's precisely what Paul argued was so shocking about the mystery of Christ. Whoever is in Christ is now a full recipient of the promises of God. Hmm. Gentile Christians are not receiving anything less than Jewish Christians because they both receive the promises on the same basis. They are united with Jesus, united to Jesus as a head to a body and thus co-heirs with him. The same is true for both men and women. Perhaps an even more shocking claim in a first century context. Both Jews and Gentiles, both men and women, are considered sons in the context of inheritance. An inheritance, of course, went from a father to a son, usually the firstborn son. A woman's share of an inheritance was derived from her marriage, which is why widows were especially economically threatened. In Christ, though, women as well as men will rule and reign in the new creation awaiting us. That is, that's the harmony with the Old Testament, as both male and female are created in the image, imagio Dei, the image of God. This means not only that they bear equal dignity and worth, although, although that's clearly true, but also that they share the mission of God and has given to humanity over the creation. At the cross, God was reclaiming a mission and an inheritance for humanity, not just for men with their dependents brought along with them, Jesus did not offer his life sacrifice for angelic beings, but only for human beings, Hebrews 2.16. The division, in terms of the reconciling power of the gospel, is not between men and women, but between human and non-human. In making a distinction between wives and husbands in Ephesians 5, and between men and women, Elsewhere in the Bible, the scriptures assume that along with our common humanity and our common destiny, there are some unique contributions of men as men and women as women. That can be controversial in some quarters, though it really should not be. Virtually, everyone recognizes that there is some uniqueness to mothering as opposed to fathering. That's why earth religions of every age will appeal to the divine feminine. They recognize something is distinct from a mother 
and virtually always this is some emphasis of life giving and nurturing. The same principle shows up when political commentators speak of a quote daddy party emphasizing issues of national defense and personal responsibility and a mommy party emphasizing a social safety net and helping for the vulnerable. Even those who would argue that gender is merely a social construct making similar concessions, setting aside the ethics of the transgender debate for a moment, the very claim that one is biologically male but truly female or vice versa with the need to present oneself as such presupposes that there is some difference beyond just social convention to maleness and femaleness. And however politically perilous it can be to make the most basic of such claims, any doctor knows that injecting a woman with testosterone or a man with estrogen will have certain predictable results that map out along the lines of male and female differences. In terms of the complementary of male and female, Christians may disagree about exactly what this means in a variety of situations. But we should all recognize a complementarity to in the creation mission, if for no other reason than that we are to be fruitful and multiply the command filled by both men and women. Indeed, they cannot undertake it without one another, though in different ways in the act of procreation. This is why the Bible refers to the primal woman as the, quote, helpmate to the man. We tend to see this as a modern corporate sense, as though the woman is somewhere on the office flowchart as assistant to the regional manager. This is hardly the case. She is the, his helpmate, not because she's below him, but because he cannot carry out the mission before him alone. He must be joined to one another, one who comes from his side, and there she is. In every culture, there is the temptation to idolize or exaggerate male and female distinctions. Ruth was both a wife and a mother and an agricultural worker. David was both a warrior and a harpist. The idea of men as exclusively, quote, wild or warrior-like or of women as exclusively, quote, sensitive or relational does not bring about gospel order, but the opposite. One can often see this tendency in churches where in some regions, the men's ministries are almost exclusively geared toward wild game dinners, celebrating hunting, and the women's ministries are almost exclusively geared toward how to set table settings and plan tea parties. Is there a place for emphasizing both? Of course, but we must compose our categories of what it means to be a man and woman from scripture and not from cultural stereotypes. In some sectors of Christianity, Nimrod and Lamech would be categorized as, quote, masculine, while the command to turn the other cheek when struck would be deemed, quote, feminine. In such cases, masculinity and femininity are defined by idols and not by the cross. A cross-shaped masculinity walks not with Esau's swagger, but with Jacob's limp. A cross-shaped femininity comes not with the glamour of Potiphar's wife, but with the Bible teaching prowess of Eunice and Lois. I love this and I will be very 
quick to re <laughs> remind some of our viewers in my last church that's exactly what we did we had the wild and tame game dinner in november and so many of the women had their uh, care and prayer group in the mall surrounded by tea and coffee. And I, and I want to say that I, it's oblivious. I, it wasn't, there's no malicious intent in that. But it's interesting how sometimes these, uh, these defined roles um, can be kind of established without, without us even knowing. What I loved uh, a few years ago, I remember being at my summer camp that I that I love to be at Camp Imidine, and I look, I picked up a brochure, and it was a women's um, a women's week, a women's retreat, and everything that they were doing was not the typical uh, crafting and scrapbooking type thing. Um, one of the things that they that they did was they learned how to use a chainsaw. I remember talking to one of the mums that was volunteering that week and she said that was th the best weekend because they've always wanted to do those kinds of things like like buck up some logs split them with an axe and sit in front of a fire and but it was always what was relegated to the men that was the wild at heart men but here women were like signing up in droves to this retreat because they wanted to you know cut logs and shoot a gun and you know like all those like hike a mountain and it was always left for the men the wild at heart men i think we have to be careful about some of these gender specific gender role things that we just don't get caught up with well that's what you do because that's just what you do I think when we are looking at our roles and if you're an egalitarian or in a complementarian, I think what I love about uh, what Russell Moore just shared too is at the end of the day during the created order, um, you are to be fruitful and multiply. We need one another. So as long as, as much as you have equality, we also need each other to procreate this planet that God's given us to to take care of so food for thought as we think about these things and how we maybe look on different ways of approaching women and men and in this culture that we're in all right god bless you guys have a great friday uh, we'll see you sunday morning 10 o'clock we have a premiere video lined up great worship uh, we're going to continue on teaching through the book of philippians hopefully you've done your homework um meaning just read the book read the book um i didn't give you any questions so don't worry there's no pdf um so yeah god bless you and we will talk to you and see you soon okay bye for now